yes so very good morning right so i hope you have seen the mcq so far right all the mcq discussion series the videos which are there in the playlist right and now coming to the next one right so in this particular series we will be discussing the mcqs in the mtp for the may 20 or the july 20 exams right the mtps is in the mock test phase the mcqs in the mtp for the july 20 exams Right, so let's begin with that. First, there are a few one mark questions over there, and then after that, you see the two mark questions over there. Right, question number one A significant deficiency exists in the process of flow of approval of tra travel reimbursements of the official. So, when you read significant deficiency, immediately SA 265. And a communicating deficiencies in internal control to those charged with governance and management should flash into your mind. Okay, so significant deficiency exists in the process of approve in the flow, flow of approval of travel reimbursements of the official. This was communicated in the previous year to TCWG and no remedial action was taken on the same so far. Right, so last year also we knew that deficiency is there. We had communicated to management but no remedial action taken so far on the significant deficiency. The auditors are of the opinion that it did not be communicated again. It says what to tell same thing again and again. We've already told it in the previous year. Is the opinion of the auditor of not to communicate the deficiency in internal control reported in the previous year correct? Right. So do you think if the deficiency was reported in the current year and no corrective action has been taken in the current year, no remedial action has been taken so far, right? Is it okay if you don't communicate it again? Right? Rather, we have to communicate it again. Right? The auditor should be communicating it again. Right? Let us see the option. Yes, the auditor is not required to communicate the same again as it is the duty of the management and TCWG to maintain the internal control system. So, auditor is saying, I have already told you, now you take the responsibility. No. The current year's communication may repeat the description from the previous communication or simply reference the previous communication. Okay. Right. See, yes, the auditor is not required to communicate the same again as written representation is being obtained from the management and TCWG that they are responsible for maintaining internal control system. Right. So you're like trying to shift the responsibility. Right. And D, no, it needs to be communicated again, but an oral reminder to TCWG on the matter may suffice. So it says tell them again, but no need to give a written description. Just oral will be sufficient. Okay, so A and C is so anyways out of question. The auditor is not required to communicate. No, these two options are out of question. Right now B and D, right, whether to repeat the description from the previous communication or just give an oral reminder. Right, so oral reminder, no. What we need is a repeat the description from the previous communication or simply refer the previous communication. Right, so B is the correct option. Right, coming to question number two. The MEA Bank Limited has sanctioned an overdraft limit of 34 crore to Bharat Limited on the working capital of the company as on 31st of March 2017. As per the bank norms, the drawing power in the overdraft account needs to be reviewed on a quarterly basis on the basis of the audited stock statement of the company. Right, so drawing power needs to be reviewed on a quarterly basis on the basis of the audited stock statement of the company. As a central statutory auditor for 1819, while verifying the advances for 2019, you notice that the bank has not obtained the stock statement of Bharat Limited for the two quarters ending 31st December 2018 and 31st March 2019. Right, so two quarters, that is six months. And no provision of NPA has been made for this in account in the financial statements for 1819. What will be your decision as the central statutory auditor? Right, classify the borrower's account as an NPA as the borrower's financial position cannot be determined due to non-submission of stock statement. Okay, right. Instruct the bank to obtain the audited stock statement for both the quarters and review the credit limit accordingly. So that is future step, futuristic step. As per the bank norms, the drawing power needs to be determined on the basis of stock statement and it was more than three months old, rather here it is six months old, right, as on 31st of March 2019. So the outstanding in the account will be deemed as irregular. You should give a qualificatory note in the audit report as per SA 700. Right, but we are not talking about the audit report. First, we need to talk over here about what to do of that particular advance. 
right so instruct the bank to take the obtain the audited stock statement that is futuristic but right now what to do then let us not go to the audit report so no a and d over here right classify the borrowers account as npa as the borrowers financial position cannot be determined what do you want to do as such with their financial position in that specifically want to decide the drawing power and it needs to be reviewed on the basis of the quarterly stock statement right so again financial position points not very much up to the mark right and as per the bank norms the drawing power huh? now they are talking about the question and it needs to be determined on the basis of the stock statement and it was more than 3 months old as on 31st of march 2019 so the outstanding in the account will be deemed as irregular right i always keep on saying in all my videos that mcq is a matter of deleting the wrong options of being convinced ke why these are the three are the wrong options then obviously ultimately what remains would be the correct answer right let's go further nakul sehdev and company llp is a firm of chartered accountants the firm has 12 partners you know one dozen partners the firm has a good portfolio of clients for statutory audit but the same clients at some other firms as their tax auditor but can statutory auditor also do the tax audit yes an internal auditor cannot be appointed as tax auditor and gst auditor but statutory auditor yes in the current financial year many existing clients for whom nakul and sardev company llp happens to be the statutory auditor have requested the firm to carry out their tax audit as well the firm is expecting the number of tax the tax audits to increase significantly this year one of the partners of the firm has also raised a point that the firm can accept tax audit up to a maximum limit do you know the maximum limit and a 60 tax audits per person right so in this firm how many partners 12 partners right and 60 tax audits per ca right so what is the total number of tax audits which can be accepted by nakul sardev and company llp 720 and a 12 into 60 okay however other partners are of the strong view that limit on audit is applicable in case of statutory audit and not for tax audit this this needs to be decided as soon as possible so that the appointment formalities can also be completed you are requested to advise the firm in this matter okay there is no limit on number of tax audits in case of llp white lie safed jhoot all the partners of the firm can collectively sign 540 tax audit report you know once upon a time the limit for the number of tax audit assignments was 45 now the limit has been upgraded to 60 right so now 540 not relevant over here all the partners of the firm can collectively sign 720 tax audit report seems okay to me but let me see read the last one before finalizing all the partners of the firm can collectively sign 540 tax audit report no that only is not acceptable however one partner of the firm can individually sign maximum 60 tax audit report no all one partner of the firm can he sign all the 720 tax audit reports also yes assuming that the other 11 are not signing any in their individual capacity you know can one partner sign all the tax audit reports on behalf of the firm yes right that is what we studied in ethics okay right paying attention listening to me seeing the video so far okay right come to let's come to the next one skj private limited is engaged in the business of construction the company has also got some real estate projects few years back on which it started the work in the last two years the annual turnover of the company is inr 600 crore and the profit of inr of 40 crore The statutory auditors of the company got rotated by another audit firm due to mandatory audit rotation requirement as per the Companies Act. And so, in this firm, there has been a change in the auditor due to the rotation provisions applicable. The new statutory auditors of the company started audit of the financial statements for 2019 in May 2019. The audit team also requested the client to provide certain information on the opening balances obviously because it's an initial audit engagement and a prior period has been audited by some predecessor auditor right so we have to follow the procedures laid down in SA 510 hai na initial audit engagement right to perform their audit procedures initially the management did not provide information to the auditors on the opening balances thinking that this is not within the scope of their work however after going through the auditing standards so they would have gone through sa 510 the management agreed and provided the required information later on the audit team also started requesting information for the period from 1st april 2019 to 31st may 2019 
right so first there is that initial audit engagements we need to check for opening balances now they are saying we need to check for subsequent events sa 560 with this requirement the cfo of the company got very upset and angry and set up a meeting with the senior members of the audit team okay what is this going on and a cfo raised a concern that the audit team has not been doing the work properly and has not been taking asking for unnecessary information like information on opening balances and then the information for the period after 31st march 2019 the audit partner explained to the cfo that everything requested by the audit team has been as per the auditing standards however cfo said that in the earlier year the previous auditor never asked for such information what is it that auditor you are only asking for all this information right you are requested to give your view in respect of this matter okay right so 510 560 both we need to follow 510 in this case because it is an initial audit engagement and 560 subsequent events anyways every audit we need to follow okay right the requirement for the auditor of the auditor for opening balances was valid for the year ended 2019 but for the period after 31st march 2019 is completely wrong as that is out of their scope for the current year audit they can ask for those details during the audit of the next year no no you have to perform the audit procedures for subsequent events also right so they are saying only 510 no 560 no no wrong right the concern of the cfo was valid he has seen the previous auditor not performing such audit procedure and hence the new audit team should also follow the same approach which was followed by the previous auditor as that would lead to efficiency in the audit right probably the earlier auditor has not done the audit in accordance with the standards on auditing and right? specified under section 14310 so it does not mean that you will also not do the audit as per the standards on auditing right so the concern of the cfo was valid no the point the answer the option is not valid right the requirement of the auditor for the opening balances as well as for the period after 31st march 2019 is valid right after the requirements of 510 and 560 the audit team is required to perform these audit procedures right so as per the requirements of 510 and 560 the audit team is required to perform these procedures seems okay but let me see the last point the audit team should set up a meeting with the previous auditor wherein it should be assessed by different approach so ask him why you did not do audit as per standards you didn't do audit class or what okay right wherein it should be assessed why different approach was followed by the previous auditor on the basis of that discussion with the previous auditor next course of action should be decided i'm telling you now creating the wrong answers for the mcq requires more creativity than writing the correct option and you know, because correct is anyways what is the fact you need to state over there but lot of creativity goes into the making of the wrong options and you know, a creating of the wrong options over there right coming to question number 5 XYZ Limited is a public limited company engaged in the manufacturing of TMT bulbs. Right, Messrs UV and Associates are the statutory auditors of XYZ Limited for the financial year 1920. Right, the company is listed on the National Stock Exchange. Right, C. A. Udhav, the engagement partner, is considering the requirement with respect to Regulation 27 and Schedule 2 L O D R for corporate governance compliance of S Y Z X Y Z Limited. Which of the following is correct in this regard? Right, so corporate governance reporting by a listed entity. What does it say? It's a public limited company engaged in the manufacturing of TMT bulbs. U V and Associates are statutory auditor. Company, it's a public company which is listed on the National Stock Exchange. Right, and C A Udav, the engagement partner, is considering the requirement with respect to Regulation Twenty Seven, which is regarding the report on corporate governance and Schedule Two for corporate governance compliance of X Y Z Limited. Which of the following option is correct in this regard? Okay, so X Y Z Limited shall submit a quarterly compliance report on corporate governance in the format as specified by its board, that is the SEBI, Securities and Exchange Board of India, from time to time to NSE within 15 days from the close of the quarter. The report shall be each signed either by the compliance officer or the chief executive officer of X Y Z Limited. Okay. 
next one xyz limited shall submit a monthly compliance report right so here it was quarterly compliance report now here it says monthly compliance report on corporate governance in the format as specified by the board right within 15 days from the end of the month so here it is saying quarter next option it is saying month the report shall be signed either by the general manager or yes either by the general manager of the accounts department of xyz limited next one c xyz limited shall submit a quarterly compliance report so again quarterly on corporate governance in the format as specified by the board from time to time to nse within 30 days so now they've changed over there instead of 15 days now within 30 days from the close of the quarter and the report shall either be signed by the compliance officer or the chief executive officer of xyz limited and the last one xyz limited shall submit the annual compliance report on corporate governance in the format specified by this board from time to time to nse within 30 days from the year end right the report shall be signed either by the general manager of the accounts department of the company right so one they are saying quarterly within 15 days second monthly within 15 days then quarterly within 30 days and then it says annually within 30 days Right. If I come to the yes, chapter 7 as per the ICAI module, right? not as per our book, right? as per the ICAI module, it talks about the report on corporate governance over there, right? regulation 27 and the schedule 2. Right? What does it say? The listed entity shall submit a quarterly compliance report on corporate governance in the format as specified by the board from time to time to the recognized stock exchange within 15 days from the close of the quarter. Right? So quarterly compliance report within 15 days from the close of the quarter. And here this is listed on NSE. That is why to the NSE. Right? The report shall either be signed by the compliance officer or the chief executive officer of the listed entity. And so compliance officer or chief executive officer. Right? The auditor shall ascertain whether the board of directors have included in the annual report of the listed entity a separate section on corporate governance with a detailed compliance report on corporate governance. Right? So whether there is a corporate governance report in the annual report of the listed entity. And any data in the report on corporate governance should not be inconsistent with that in the contained in the financial statements. Right? So what is the requirement over here? Right? Quarterly compliance report within 15 days from the close of the quarter. And the report shall be signed either by the compliance officer or the chief executive officer of the listed entity. Right? So which should be the correct answer over here? A is the correct option. And a submit a quarterly compliance report within 15 days from the close of the quarter and the report shall either be signed either by the compliance officer or the chief executive officer of XYZ limited. Wonderful. Right. Coming to the next one. Question number six. Which among the following is not a factor? Right. So sometimes they ask which is a factor? Positive question. Sometimes they ask a negative question which is not a factor. And so three would be the factors and one would not be the factor in that case. For determining the necessity to use an auditor's expert to assist in obtaining sufficient appropriate audit evidence, right? So that is SA 620, using the work of an auditor's expert. There we discuss about determining the need for an auditor's expert. Right, that whether I can obtain the SAAE sufficient appropriate audit evidence on my own or whether I should use the work of an expert, whether I should appoint an expert. What are the factors which will help me determine and out of this which is not the factor? Okay, right, the use of a management expert by the management in preparing financial statements. So you come to know that management has also appointed a management expert. You're trying to evaluate the work of the management expert on your own, but you're not understanding what work has been done by management expert. That is why now auditor, what you do, you appoint an auditor's expert. And you tell auditor's expert on your behalf to evaluate the work of the management expert. And you tell the audit yes, the auditor's expert on your behalf to evaluate the work of the management expert. Next one, the presence of an internal audit function and verification of the subject matter by them. God knows why internal audit function. Okay, is the company having internal audit or, or no? Presence of internal audit function or no? Accordingly, it says you should determine whether you should work the work of an expert. And it doesn't seem to be very correct. 
right the nature and significance of the matter including its complexity obviously the more complex the matter the more we would prefer to use the work of an expert to obtain the evidence and the rmm the risk of material misstatement in the matter obviously the higher the risk of material misstatement the more the specialized staff right the more the experienced staff the more the use the work of a work of an expert right so what are the three factors these three are the factors right so which is not a factor the presence of the internal audit function right so b is the correct option right the presence of an internal audit function right so let's come to question number 7 right so see all different variety questions they have asked so far and you know, they ask regarding 265 right then after that bank audit then after that tax audit right then after that they ask regarding the 510 and 560 initial audit engagement and subsequent events then after that sebi lodr then 620 right and now coming to next one again tax audit form 3 cd rk and associates are the tax auditors of opq private limited while performing the procedures in respect of clause 21d of form 3 cd right what this clause 21d of form 3 cd payments in excess of 10000 and are being made by other than account pay check or account pay draft the tax auditors came across various payment vouchers where the cash payment exceeds inr 50000 rupees during a day the tax auditors want the management to report all of these payments in form 3cd when it comes across payment of vouchers payment vouchers where the cash paid exceeds 50000 rupees during a day and the tax auditor wants the management to report all these payments in the form 3cd and the payments in excess of 10000 right however the management had a different view the management said that the payment voucher is one for various payments made during a day to various or same parties but any payment made to various parties or all payments be taken together during to a day to a single party do not exceed the criteria for reporting under clause 21d of form 3 cd so they have not mentioned the amount of 10000 that they have kept it under suspense and it says the payment to a single party does not exceed the criteria for reporting under 21d of form 3c d right please suggest how would you deal with this matter as the tax auditor and so payment to a single person in a single day is not exceeding the amount over there of 10000 the cumulative different parties put together it is 50000 but to a single party is it exceeding the amount no okay since the payment is in a single voucher exceeds the prescribed limit it should be reported in form 3 cd otherwise the tax auditor should report this in his tax audit report so it says directly qualify qualify rather report it okay since the payment in a single voucher exceeds the prescribed limit it should be reported in form 3 cd so similar to above tax auditor should qualify his report and send a written communication about this matter to income tax department social service and a written communication to income tax department look at this company what they are doing and we will cut the point none of the payment to a single party during a day exceeds the prescribed limit thus it should not be reported in form 3c d and a single party payment not exceeding so should not, should not be reported and d since the payment in a single voucher exceeds the prescribed limit it should be reported in form 3c d however tax auditor may ignore this if the amount is immaterial boss you can't decide over here whether it is material or immaterial the limits have been specified in law then you know, 10000 the limit is given in the law all right however he should insist the management to give a disclosure of the same in form 3 cd and should emphasize the same point in his tax audit report no 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 qualification and no, no written communication to income tax department no emphasis of matter paragraph so now simple a or c either report it or not report it right so should we report or not report and no, not report why not report because payment to a single party does not exceed the prescribed limit right and hence that is why no reporting required right hence that is why no reporting required right so c is the correct option right i hope all of you are with me right okay while investigating the matters relating to possible misappropriation of cash now they have come to the chapter of investigation due diligence forensic audit and you know, it's like a roller coaster ride entire syllabus they cover and you now while investigating the matters relating to possible misappropriation of cash cashier says that every day cash is counted and reviewed by the finance head 
cashier is saying every day cash is counted and it is also reviewed by the finance head your specimen review indicates that daily cash summary was not signed off by the finance head cashier told you that every day he counts it and it is reviewed by finance head what you found that finance head he is not signing it every day in this situation you would conclude that cashier is not telling truth he is not telling the truth but not telling the truth to aage kya hai na it is not being signed by the finance head that you found out but what about it okay consider extending investigation procedures like corroborative inquiry with finance head review of appropriate daily cash summaries etc okay conclude that finance head is not a responsible person ha to i concluded that he is not a responsible person but then what next you know what about the conclusion i conclude that cashier is not telling truth but what next okay right conclude that daily cash summary is not relevant for investigation are cash is one of the most fraud prone area you know embezzlement of cash we talk about suppressing of receipts or inflating of payments right so again we cannot conclude that cash is not relevant even though if you conclude that finance that is not a responsible person it is of no use to us even if we conclude that cashier is not telling truth it is of no use to us so rather than concluding anything let us just consider something and you know, rather than just concluding anything let us consider something over here and you know, consider in extending the investigation procedures like corroborative inquiry with the finance and review of appropriate daily cash summary etc wonderful right coming to question number 9 the tax auditor shall express an opinion when the audit yes oh, sorry the auditor i'm so sorry right the auditor shall express opinion when the auditor having obtained sufficient appropriate audit evidence huh? so has auditor obtained sufficient appropriate audit evidence yes concludes that right what does the auditor conclude that misstatements individually or in the aggregate are both material and pervasive to the financial statements right so are there material misstatements yes and are they material and pervasive you know so it reminds us of our 2 by 2 matrix of sa 705 you know two reasons for modification material misstatement or unable to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence for these two reasons we need to check the pervasiveness material but not pervasive or material and pervasive right and then material misstatement material but not pervasive qualified opinion material and pervasive adverse opinion right unable to obtain evidence material but not pervasive qualified opinion and unable to obtain evidence material and pervasive it would lead to a disclaimer of opinion right so here what does it say misstatements individually or in the aggregate are both material and pervasive right so this would lead to an adverse opinion right so no qualified no disclaimer no question of claim and all the only three types are there now so they had to create a d option a right? d option they could have either written some emphasis of matter other matter key audit matter or no reporting required or clean report right so just a wrong option created over there right so what is the correct option over there a adverse opinion okay next one question number 10 what is the difference between management audit and operational audit and we study one question you know called as management audit and operational audit are complementary and supplementary to one another and so what is the distinguish between management audit and operational audit right management audit is an audit of the management whereas operational audit is an audit for the management right in management audit we check for the quality of managing in the organization right evaluating the manager's ability to manage decision making audit whereas operational audit we check for the three e's hai na the efficiency economy and the effectiveness of the operations in the organization in a efficiency economy and effectiveness now let us look at the permutation combinations which they have created in the answer management audit is concerned with the quality of operation and it is audit for management as if we have not done the class hai na ye galat hai quality management audit is quality of operations wrong combination and wrong combination so out and there is operational audit is concerned with quality of managing and it is audit of management had they written management ke jagah operational and operational ke jagah management this would have been the correct option yes 
understanding okay next one management audit is concerned with quality of managing seems sensible so far and it is audit for management out it is an audit of the management no management audit an operational audit is quality of operational and it is audit of the management so second half they've done the mistake right see management audit is concerned with quality of managing okay and a quality of managing and it is audit of the management both look good to me right whereas operational audit is concerned with quality of operations wonderful and it is audit for the management now our thinking is matching and now our thinking is matching right let's see the last one management audit is concerned with quality of operations out right and it is audit of the management so ye theek hai it is audit of the management but quality of operations no that's not the correct option whereas operational audit is concerned with quality of managing out and it is audit for the management no right so right different permutation combinations we have created over there right so that's the first 10 questions right now let's come to question number 11 to 20 right which are the integrated case scenario and right so just to give you an initial understanding that now these they started with this integrated case scenario right so rather than giving a small question and then the four options a small question and then the que option and so far the 10 questions we studied that is in that format the small question is given or whatever question is given then there are four option question is given and then there are four option now what they do the entire question ka database they give it together and all they compile it together and then after that cumulative for that entire database they start asking the question right that is the concept of integrated case study right so all the theory all the relevant content is put together and again they combine it from different different chapters right so that's the integrated case study right let us read it right always do not spend too much of time in deeply analyzing the content of the theory part okay we have to analyze or understand that part more correctly which is relevant to our question being asked and so read do the first reading then come to the question and then whatever is relevant to the question that part in the case study you focus on okay theek hai right integrated case scenario 1 Messrs Q S and Associate Chartered Accountant, a Chennai-based audit firm, had taken up the following assignments for financial year 1920, assessment year 2021. Okay, so you know when somebody from Chennai is listening to this particular video, they immediately feel the connect. Right? Actually, there is no such. Had they written over there the Hyderabad-based audit firm or the Mumbai-based audit firm or the Delhi-based audit firm, right? Or any city for that matter, right? Any, you know, it could be just any city. But you know, the moment you find that oh, Chennai-based, then you start the thought comes. So why did they mention Chennai? Then you come to know ah, COVID is quite a lot over there right now. Okay. Anyways, and anyways, it's quite a lot in the entire world only. Okay, so Q S and Associate Chartered Accountant, a Chennai-based audit firm. Right? Then you think in Chennai, is there any Q S and Associates and all? You say, ma'am, we never thought, but now that you are saying, we started thinking. ठीक है, right? Had taken up the following assignment for financial year 1920, assessment year 2021, right? To conduct the management audit of B R Limited and to conduct the operational audit of S I Limited, which is the subsidiary of B R Limited. Right, so they've undertaken an assignment. Which assignment they've taken? Management audit and operational audit. Right, management audit of B R and operational audit of S I, which is a subsidiary of B R. ठीक है, that's the first fact in the story. यानी you know, in the case study. Next one, statutory audit. Next assignment which they accepted, the statutory audit of Messrs General Insurance Limited. The company has a paid-up capital of fifteen thousand lakh, which include preliminary expenses. Okay, listen, read carefully. Which include preliminary expenses of three thousand four hundred lakh. During the course of audit of the company, there was a difference of opinion between auditor and management with respect to the minimum amount of solvency margin which needs to be maintained by the company. However, the issue was later settled. हाँ तो पहला पार्ट ऑफ़ दी क्वेश्चन, फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ़ दी क्वेश्चन, मैनेजमेंट ऑपरेशनल ऑडिट, देन इंश्योरेंस कंपनी ऑडिट, देन नेक्स्ट वन, राइट डी ऑडिटर ऑफ़ अ लिस्टेड एंटिटी हैज़ रिजाइन ड्यू टू हिज़ पर्सनल रीज़न, राइट सो लिस्टेड एंटिटी ऑडिटर हैज़ रिजाइन, है ना रेजिग्नेशन ऑफ़ कंपनी ऑ The board of directors of the company appointed Q S and associates as replacement. है ना सो सेम चेन्नई बेस्ड ऑडिट फॉर्म एस रिप्लेसमेंट विदिन 30 डेज. 
Huh? So now this is an example of casual vacancy due to resignation. Right? You do you know the provision for casual vacancy due to resignation? Right? The auditor will be appointed by the board of directors within 30 days from the date of the resignation, from the date of casual vacancy. However, as it is due to resignation, it shall also be approved by the members at the EGM within three months from the date of recommendation of the board. And it shall also be approved by the members at the EGM within three months from the date of recommendation of the board. Okay, the firm has also accepted, right, had appointed QS and associates as replacement within 30 days. The firm also accepted the assignment without communicating about the same to the previous auditor. Array, you should take NOC from the outgoing auditor. No, otherwise guilty of professional misconduct under, where guilty? Hana fails to obtain an NOC, communicate with the outgoing auditor, guilty of professional misconduct under 811. Right, clause 8, part 1, first schedule. The firm also accepted the assignment without communicating about the same to the previous auditor. Certain shareholders of the firm opposed the appointment and later the problem was solved. Okay, statutory auditor, right? Next, they accepted the statutory auditor of SGH Private Limited Company having paid up capital of 112 lakh and a negative balance of 15 lakh in the reserve. Yani ke debit balance in the profit and loss account and a negative reserves. After a long discussion between the auditor and the management of the company with respect to the applicability of CARO 2016, both of them arrived at a conclusion. But the suspense is what conclusion they arrived at, not given. Okay, so CARO question. Then during the year, the company had also received few other assignments. So my God, QS and Associates is getting a lot of work over there. Right, so during the year, the company had also received few other assignments with respect to valuation for purpose of direct taxes, actuarial valuation services, cost audit of a private limited company, etc, 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 etc. However, since the firm was not having enough expertise from its side with respect to those kind of assignments, they could not accept the same. As a result of this, the partners of QS and Associate decided to induct three new partners into the firm. And so enters into partnership in or outside India. Right? So entering into partnership 411, clause 4, part 1, first schedule. The new partners included Mrs. E, an engineering graduate from IIT Madras. Mr. C, a member of the Institute of Cost and Work Accountants of India. Mr. A, an architect and member of the Indian Institute of Architects. And also all contents they have given it together. Right? So rather than giving one content and asking a question, first integrated the content. And now they will start asking the question. And a question number 11. What is the minimum solvency margin that has to be maintained by I General Insurance Limited? Right, so what is the solvency margin that they need to maintain? Right, solvency margin, right, as per the Insurance Act, an excess of value of assets over the amount of liabilities. And when assets are more than liabilities, that is solvency. And an excess of value of assets over the amount of liabilities to be maintained by the insurer at all times, right, which shall not be less than 50% of the minimum paid up share capital. Right, which shall not be less than 50% of the paid up share capital. Right, as such, what is the minimum paid up share capital for insurance company? 100 crores. And excluding, and not including, excluding the preliminary expenses incurred in the formation and registration of the company. Now here in this case, how much is your paid up share capital? 15,000 lakh. 15,000 lakh, but it is including the preliminary expenses of 3,400, right? So that preliminary expenses of 3,400 we'll have to reduce. So then it will come to 11,600 lakhs, right? And 50% of the minimum paid up share capital. So then 11,600 lakh divided by 2, right? That will give me 5,800 lakh. Right, that will give me how much solvency margin they need to maintain is the 5,800 lakh. Right, so what is the minimum solvency margin which is required to be maintained? Right, 58 crore. Now see, this is how they complicate your life. In the question, they will put it in lakhs. Now here you have to convert it into crore. And also 58 crore, 7,500 lakh, 5.8 crore and 750 lakh. And if you directly do 15,000 divided by 2, then it will come to 7,500 lakh. And your life will become wrong over here. 
है ना आंसर दी ऑप्शन विल बिकम रॉन्ग ओवर देयर है ना सेवन थाउजेंड फाइव हंड्रेड लैक सेवन फिफ्टी लैक नो नो फिफ्टी एट करोड़ और फाइव पॉइंट एट करोड़ राइट सो इट इज फिफ्टी एट हंड्रेड लैक आई वॉन्ट टू कन्वर्ट इट इन टू करोड़ राइट सो डिवाइडेड बाय हंड्रेड सो दैट विल गिव मी फिफ्टी एट करोड़ राइट सो दैट वुड गिव मी द फिफ्टी एट करोड़ राइट सो विच इज द करेक्ट ऑप्शन ओवर देयर ए इज द करेक्ट ऑप्शन right a is the correct option an excess of value of assets over the amount of liability which shall not be less than 50% of the paid up share capital and when you calculate the paid up share capital it is excluding the preliminary expenses incurred in the formation and registration of the company okay right right next one what could be the possible reason for the objection raised by the shareholders of the listed company an objection was raised by the shareholders when the earlier auditor resigned a new auditor was appointed and the auditor of a listed company resigned right the board of directors appointed qs and associates as replacement the firm accepted the assignment without communicating about the same to the previous auditor so that is the mistake from the firm side and shareholders also objected why because it should have been approved by the members at the egm within 3 months from the date of recommendation of the board why because the casual vacancy in this case is due to resignation right let us see the option appointment of the incoming auditor should have been approved by the members within 60 days from the date of such appointment appointment of the incoming auditor should have been approved by sebi hey bhagwan why did they get sebi over there and you know, within 30 days from the date of such appointment appointment of incoming auditor should have been approved by the members within 30 days from the date of such appointment so sebi is so out of question appointment of the incoming auditor should have been approved by the members within 3 months from the date of such appointment and so which is the correct number over there 3 months no 60 days no 30 days right so days and amounts are very important now now in the mcqs theek hai next one looking at the above appointment what is the appropriate inference which you can make about the professional ethics of qs and associate chartered accountant and they are guilty of professional misconduct under 712 for being grossly negligent in the conduct of his professional duty are rabi to work has only not started where you are making them where there is gross negligence you know what is 712 does not exercise due diligence or is grossly negligent in the conduct of his professional duties right they are guilty of professional misconduct as per 811 due to non communication to previous auditor seems to be the right one okay they are guilty of professional misconduct as per 812 due to non communication of previous auditor if you don't study ethics properly then you might think of 812 what is 812 yes what is 812 fails to obtain a sufficient information which is necessary for expression of opinion or its exceptions are sufficiently material to negate the expression of an opinion right so no 812 what we require over here is 811 and last one they are not guilty of any professional misconduct no 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 they are guilty of professional misconduct under 811 okay next one whether caro is applicable to fgh private limited if so why okay so yes what is the amounts over there right what are the amounts given over there for caro paid up share capital of 112 lakh and a negative balance of 15 lakh right so that negative balance and a debit balance in profit and loss account is always required to be deducted from the paid up share capital always to be reduced and a negative reserves right so in that case it will come to 97 lakh right and the other parameters right regarding the borrowings and turnover have not been given right they've only given the requirement for the paid up share capital which should be 1 crore or more right here it is coming to only 97 lakh okay right so let's look into the option no since as per para 1 of caro 2016 that is not applicable to any private limited company no no we know certain private limited companies if they fulfill those condition then not applicable if they exceed any one of the amount caro applicable since the paid up share capital of the company exceeds 1 crore caro is applicable no na it is not exceeding 1 crore we have to reduce the debit balance in profit and loss account and a negative reserves since the total paid up share capital and reserves of the company exceed rupees 1 crore in absolute term no absolute term nothing 
No, since the total paid up share capital and reserves of the company does not exceed rupees 1 crore, right? As it is only coming to 97 lakh, right? It is less than 1 crore. Why? Because debit balance and profit and loss account is to be reduced. Next one. Right. As for the Chartered Accountants Act, what can you infer from the addition of the three new partners in Messrs QS and Associates? Right. So they've entered into partnership with who all? Right. Engineer. Right. Engineer. Then the cost accountant and then also the architect. Right. As for 411, right. With whom all can you now enter into partnership with CS? Right. Then CMA. Right. Then advocate. Right. That is the Bar Council of India. Right, then the architect, right, the architect, right, then the actuary and also the engineer. And the engineer sharing, accepting and per, what do you say? So, per, uh, canvassing not allowed, but entering into partnership allowed and with engineer. When we see the list of, you know, two, three, four, for two, three, four, five. And a sharing, accepting, partnership and canvassing. And an engineer sharing, accepting and canvassing not allowed, but entering into partnership allowed. Right, so here they've entered into partnership with engineer, CMA and architect. Is it allowed? Yes, all these three partnerships are not allowed. The firm is guilty under 411 for entering into partnership with person other than chartered accountant, guilty of partnership with all three of them. Okay, the firm is guilty of misconduct under 411. So all cases they are saying 411 only for entering into partnership with person other than chartered accountant or a member of a professional body. Right, guilty for a partnership with E and A alone, who are engineer and architect. Right, so it says that CMA would be fine. Right, and the firm is guilty again under 411 for entering into partnership with person other than chartered accountant or a member of professional body. Now they are saying guilty for partnership with A and advocate. Right, so engineer and CMA allowed. Right, and the firm is not guilty of any professional misconduct. Right, so all the three partnerships are permitted, and that is why the firm is not guilty of any professional misconduct right coming to the next integrated case scenario right so wonderful questions drafted over there okay right qrp life care private limited the company or qrp is engaged in the pharmaceutical right pharmaceutical industry is in the boom right waiting for the medicine to come okay right the company is based in hyderabad and has an annual turnover of 400 crore one of the directors of the company did not give the declaration to the company under section 164.2 of the Companies Act 2013 as at 31st of March. Right? What is the declaration under 164 subsection 2? The disqualification of the directors. You know, whether the directors are disqualified. Right? The auditors of the company have completed their audit for 2018 and are waiting for this declaration. But the management is of the view that they will not be able to receive this declaration. All the other directors have given the required declaration and the auditors have also verified that. Huh? So one of the director has not given the declaration for 164.2. First situation. Second one, QRP Limited had given an QRP had given an advance amounting to 50 crore to its subsidiary RPS on 12th of January 2014 for carrying out certain projects. The net worth of the subsidiary has eroded substantially as on 31st of March 2018 and looking at the future projection, there is no certainty in terms of the profitability of the subsidiary. Right? So they have given an advance to the subsidiary and the net worth of that subsidiary has eroded and also there is no certainty about the profitability. So the, is the advance given to the subsidiary, the recoverability of that is doubtful over here and the recoverability of the advance given to the subsidiary company. Next one, QRP has a subsidiary, SPS Limited. So one subsidiary, RPS, another subsidiary, SPS, right, in UK. The company has outstanding trade receivable amounting to INR 10 crore from SPS. QRP has observed that there have been some FEMA non-compliances on the part of QRP, but the management has an action plan which have initiated, been initiated and the basis of which management is sure that the non-compliance would be done good and there would be no penalty on the company. In case the penalty arises, the impact would be significant for QRP. The auditors of QRP have evaluated this matter by involving a regulatory matter expert and also agree with the management view. Right? So some FEMA non-compliance, but management is positive about the same. And they've also taken an expert opinion for the same. Next one. QRP was using a customized ERP package up to 31st March 2018. 
However, with effect from 1st April 2018, QRP moved on to SAP ERP package considering the increase in the size of operations of QRP. The auditors of QRP are of the view that for the financial year 19, being the first year of SAMP implementation, no work on IT controls would be required and they are also evaluating to qualify the report on IFC because on the basis of their experience on other clients in the past where the IT controls in the first year of ERP implementation were very weak. Right, so they are saying it's your first year, so this year we are not going to review and generally we know that first year there is a problem, so we are going to directly qualify the report, no checking, nothing. And no, no work on IT control would be required because it will take its own time. On the basis of the above mentioned facts, you are required to answer the following MCQ. And so one integrated MCQ, they created it from the viewpoint of the CA firm, and a QS and associates, and now one they have created it from the viewpoint of a company. Okay, so now let's look into the question. Right, how should the auditors of QRP deal with the matter relating to non-receipt of declaration under 164.2 of the Companies Act? Right, so one of the director has not given the declaration. Right, auditors may perform alternative audit procedures in respect of non-receipt of declaration. If the auditors have been able to verify that all directors except one have given the required declaration as per the Companies Act, then it should be ignored by the auditor, by the auditor on the basis of materiality. Or where materiality and where to ignore? Each director independently you need to give mention. No, you have to consider each of the director ka declaration, right? Whether they are disqualified or no. So you can't ignore it on the grounds of materiality. Take it. There is no reporting implication due to non-receipt of declaration under 164.2 from just one director. It says, what are you making an issue about? It is just one director who is not given the declaration. Accordingly, the auditor should issue clean report in respect of this matter. However, the auditor should insist the management to provide this declaration later on. Okay, right now we'll issue clean report. Later on, you give it to us. Uh, no such adjustment to be done. Uh, no, no adjusting CA. You have to be an associate CA, right? associate chartered accountant or a fellow chartered accountant. Auditor would need to report this matter in their main report. Right? So as a matter of fact, okay, auditor, you need to report this matter in your main report. Right? So alternative procedures, no, we have to obtain the declaration itself. Right? So auditor would need to report this matter in their main report. Right? So this will come under 143.3. And a 143.3, information proper, branch, books, AS, adverse, director's maintenance, right? So that director's over there, right? It is regarding the whether any of the directors of the company are disqualified under section 164.2, right? We write on the basis of written representation and the declarations received from the directors, right? So here we will have to mention this in our main report, right? Coming to the next one, question number 17. How should the auditors of QRP deal with the matter relating to the erosion of net worth of RPS? Is there any reporting implication for the same? You know, one of the subsidiary to whom they've given an advance, that subsidiary net worth is eroded. Right? So what would be the implication? You know, how would the auditor of QRP deal with the matter? In respect of QRP, there is no reporting implication on the part of auditor of QRP due to erosion in the net worth of RPS, that is the subsidiary. This matter would be relevant for the auditor of RPS, but QRP has given an advance. No, you can't say that this matter is not relevant for QRP only. Okay. In respect of QRP, auditors of QRP would need to give an emphasis of matter paragraph in their report considering the uncertainty involved relating to profitability of RPS. Right? So they are giving, saying, put it in emphasis of matter paragraph. Then in respect of QRP, the auditors of QRP right, would need to give qualification in respect of non-recovery of advances from RPS if the adjustment entry is not recorded in the books. So it says the management should give a provision over there because this advance, the recoverability is doubtful. And if the management does not make a provision for the same, then auditor needs to qualify his report. Okay. And D option, in respect of QRP, auditor of QRP would need the management to include a note in the financial statements of QRP explaining about the recoverability of advances. And if boss says, note de ke thodi chalega, you will have to make a provision. Because there is a doubt regarding the recoverability of the advances, right? So only giving a note, no. No reporting implication, no. Right? So now whether to give emphasis of matter or qualification. 
right whether to give an eom or whether to give a qo that is a qualified opinion right so this point it says would need to give a qualification in respect of non recovery of advance from rpf if the adjustment entry is not recorded it seems to be more correct now if they record the adjustment entry then there is no need for a qualification but if they don't make the adjustment then auditor you will have to qualify your opinion right i'm very happy with all of you those who are seeing the video so far right you are on the right track right super right coming to question number 18 so that does not mean you will not see the rest and you will complete the entire video now theek hai please suggest the way see they tell you please suggest the way auditors have handled the matter relating to fema non compliance is it appropriate or not right auditors didn't handle this matter appropriately auditor should have informed about this matter to rbi i don't know what do you, you know inform to sebi you know inform to in written communication to income tax authority now they are saying inform to rbi within a period of 30 days from the date this matter came to their knowledge as if you know you have come to know about a fraud in the company and you have to report it to the central government so here you have come to know about fema non compliance right auditors handled this matter appropriately the management would need to include this matter in the notes to accounts to the financial statement okay auditor handled this matter appropriately but they would also need to include a modification in their report because of the impact of penalty if levied can be material now to abhi to it is not certain it is if levied can be material right an auditor could have handled this matter in a better manner it says abhi hai na the question is has the auditor handled the matter so first they say didn't handle then they say handled handled now they say last one over there could have handled the matter in a better manner by also involving a tax expert because this might result in a penalty and that may have some taxation impact for the company now where they have come to the tax impact and all hai na just a filler point over there right so now between these two when an auditor handled this matter appropriately but the management would need to include this matter in the notes an auditor handled this matter appropriately but they would also need to include a modification in their report because the impact of the penalty if levied now right now we don't know now whether the penalty will come or no uh, if it comes and if it is not recorded then auditor you'll have to qualify but right now you don't need to qualify right so auditors handled this matter appropriately the management would need to include this matter in the notes to account to the financial statement right so b is the correct option right coming to 19 qrp has been preparing consolidated financial statements so they have been preparing but they do not consolidate financial statements of sps every year in our question integrated case study they have given two subsidiaries now rps limited and second is sps limited which is in uk so they are saying sps is not being consolidated right qrp has been preparing consolidated financial statements but they do not consolidate financial statements of sps every year why do they not consolidate sps every year this is because the financial year followed by sps is january to december as against april to march followed by qrp right the auditors have also been fine with this position of the management of qrp year on year please suggest right so they are saying it's okay you know unka accounting year alag hai tumhara alag hai different different accounting years both of you are following so don't consolidate your view is correct right? auditors are also fine right a qrp needs to prepare consolidated financial statements by also consolidating sps in case this is not done the auditor needs to qualify their report on conso okay qrp needs to prepare consolidated by consolidating sps in case this is not done the auditor needs to give an emphasis of matter paragraph so always the conflict is between qualified and emphasis of matter paragraph okay qrp's management view is right because sps is a foreign company and hence so consolidation may be done while preparing consolidated financial statements in india hai na let's not talk about it further and a foreign company that is why not consolidate there is no logic behind that and auditors of qrp they are giving such an important suggestion to auditor should have done materiality assessment in respect of non consolidation of sps in the conso the auditor should ask the management to include a note and also take the management representation letter for the same 
है ना यू शुड हैव डन मटीरियलिटी असेसमेंट वॉट इज द यूज ऑफ डूइंग मटीरियलिटी असेसमेंट इट शुड हैव बीन इंक्लूडेड इन दी इन द कंसॉलिडेटेड फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट इट सेल्फ एंड इफ नॉट इंक्लूडेड देन वॉट टू डू क्वालिफाइड और एम्फोसिस ऑफ मैटर right it would lead to a qualified opinion right not only it won't suffice by only mentioning about it in the emphasis of matter paragraph right so the auditor needs to qualify the opinion right and then we come to the last one over there as an expert you know they are saying auditor you are expert student you are expert what will be your advice about the view of the auditor of qrp regarding not testing it controls in the first year of sap implementation and evaluating the qualification in ifc report so they think first year they are generally weak so we'll not check only we'll directly put it in the report what is your view okay the auditors have precedence on the basis of which they have formed an opinion and that is completely acceptable it says there is a strong logic behind what the auditor is saying however the auditor would need to document this properly in their audit file so it says auditor has lot of experience basis that he is saying so so just document it properly in your audit file okay the auditors need to perform procedures before forming any view any such precedence of other client cannot be taken for qrp without performing any procedure by the auditor you know so some of your friend is not studying that is why you are not studying don't take any such precedence so many of your friends are studying you take their precedence no or you set a precedence for others good precedence huh? not a bad one okay next one the auditors have precedence on the basis of which they have formed a view and that is fine as far as they don't want to test it control however to qualify the ifc report on the basis of precedence of other client only may not be appropriate management should include a note in their financial statements in respect of first year of sap implementation but the auditor has precedence and that is fine as far as they don't want to take a uh, test it control you cannot have your own views over there right the auditors have precedence on the basis of which they formed a view and that is fine as far as they don't want to test it control however instead of a qualification disclaimer would be appropriate in the ifc because there is no work for making any conclusion by the auditor and somehow this auditor he does not want to do the checking for the control in the first year right management should also include a note in their financial statements in respect of the first year of sap implementation right so obviously first you try to do the testing and then if you don't get the evidence you can give disclaimer you don't want to do any testing that is not right right so the auditors have precedence on the matter no right so see three points what are they saying auditors have precedence auditors have precedence auditors have precedence and also something similar in the uh, incorrect options over there and the auditor needs to perform the procedures before forming any view any such precedence of other client cannot be taken for qrp without performing any procedures by the auditor right so that completes our discussion for the 20 mcqs right which are there in the mtp for the july 20 exams right thank you so much